please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello there, good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. It's a start to the new week, the expiry week that is. I'm Mangla Malu, with me is Surbhi Upadhyay. Good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast, Surbhi. <laughs> and it's a good day that you start because uh, we're at record highs. Post-market, we got positive cues coming in from results, the biggest of them all, Reliance beat estimates. Yep. And also some good news over the weekend as far as the big merger is concerned. So a lot of triggers for our market. The government seems to be happy. They've got some money, so it's a good way to start off. We're getting closer to the budget. But yes, there's that cloud in the air around the US government shutdown and whether that's going to have any impact or not on markets, on stocks. First up, let's take a look at how the Asian markets are trading as we speak. They're mildly lower on Monday. Investors are keeping an eye out on political developments that are taking place in the US. Remember, on Friday, there was a government shutdown. Yesterday, too, it was shut down, but there was some slight progress out there. The Asian market still taking that knot into their stride very well and down about quarter of a percent for the Nikkei. The Korean markets, they are actually lower. The Japanese market actually will also be focusing on the two-day Bank of Japan meet that starts today. So tomorrow is uh, the decision likely. As far as the Korean markets are concerned, they are led lower by index heavyweight Samsung Electronics, in fact, was down about two and a half percent. And also the government is mulling a 50-year bond. So those things are keeping that index active. Absolutely flat for both the Straits as well as the Taiwanese indices. The SGX Nifty, that one should come up for you. We're working with a record high on our markets. The SGX Nifty indicates that maybe there's not much damage to that. A flattish start with a mild five-point downtick. Okay, that's as far as Asia goes, but it's all about the U.S. market as well. And of course, the politics that's making headlines in that country. Now, U.S. stocks did close higher on Friday with the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq notching record closes once again. However, the U.S. government remained closed even on Sunday as those parlays continued. Republicans and Democrats continue to blame each other for the government shutdown. The Senate voted down the bill that would have originally kept the government funded through the 16th of February. Now what's under discussion is at least a bill that can keep the government running till the 8th of February, but we don't have a deal as yet. President Trump is calling for the nuclear option, which means uh, bypassing certain rules to go through a simple majority in the Senate. So it's a, uh, it's a bit of a cliffhanger right now. Let's get you more in the CNBC report. Washington, D.C. An escalation of words and blame on the Senate floor. This shutdown was a political miscalculation of gargantuan proportions. But Democratic leaders are blaming President Trump. To keep the government open, they wanted a deal to protect young immigrants from deportation. In exchange, they agreed to give Mr. Trump money for his promised border wall. But Democrats claim he walked away from that compromise. This is the Trump shutdown. Only President Trump can end it. We Democrats are at the table, ready to negotiate. The president needs to pull up a chair and end this shutdown. While the leaders spar, negotiations behind closed doors are making progress before millions of federal workers are shut out of their jobs Monday morning. Resolution gets more difficult the longer we wait. What about Republican Senator Lindsey Graham now ready to change his no vote to yes. And I'm not asking anybody to trust anybody. I'm asking people to grow up. The Senate needs 60 votes to move forward in its next step to fund the government. But in a tweet, President Trump wrote, if stalemate continues, Republicans should go to 51 percent nuclear option and vote on real long-term budget. The next vote is scheduled for 1 a.m. on the Senate floor. Both Democrat and Republican senators say progress is being made and a vote could be taken earlier tonight if a compromise is reached. On that note, let's get in some expert opinion on what this government shutdown could mean for the economy and, of course, for what happens ahead and, of course, the road ahead for the market. Trump is not going to give in at this point, doesn't think that he needs to, wants to get his agenda moving forward. The Democrats have said they're at the table, you know, I think this is really a personality issue between Schumer and Trump. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what I think people need to realize is that this is the mechanism that's in place right now. It's not ideal by yeah. my standards. I think the world is looking at it from a different lens and trying to figure it out. I think what people have to realize is this has no real implication on yeah. what's going on in the U.S. Mm -hmm. economy. First of all, it didn't last very long. No. I think more than uh, half of them since uh, 1977. I think we have 18 of them. We're less than three days. 
So it should not much of an impact. You shouldn't see it in a high frequency data. Maybe some data is going to be delayed, but not much an impact. Does it change the fact that the dollar stays on the pressure? Probably not. Or maybe it reinforces the fact that you want to go for growth, and that means emerging market. I don't really think there are any serious economic effects. It should be a very temporary thing. It might have some political influence, and then maybe through the political influence that might affect some policies that are enacted, whether about defense spending, health care spending, or other kinds of uh, effects like that. All right, then let's take a flight across the Atlantic. Then in the European markets, the three main indices, as we're seeing, are the ones which ended higher with the German DAX actually outperforming ending with gains of over a percent, trying to get a handle on which was the stock that really took that index higher. But in the meantime, also take a look at the economic data. The Eurozone current account numbers showed a wider account surplus in November on to a on, uh, and then moving on to the political developments, the German centre-left Social Democrats, they've agreed to start formal coalition with the centre-right CDU and that one leading really to the outperformance of the German index. Across the periphery though, we saw some gains come by in the Italian index, the Spanish index. The one that really underperformed was the Ukrainian index. That one should come up for you with a cut of about a percent and a half. Uh, remember minimum uh, 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 mixed queues coming, rather mixed queues coming in from the Russian index as well. Oil com oil related countries really doing not too well. Ukraine down about 1.5%, the Russian index down about 0.65% from the emerging market space. The Brazilian index though, eking out gains of about a third of a percent. All right, let's shift focus to currencies now. And now uh, we are seeing the dollar pretty much stabilize after the US government shutdown. It's not moving too much. It's pretty range bound versus a lot of the big currencies out there. Trading uh, with minor gains right now versus the uh, Japanese yen. The euro has been, of course, on the rise. And this after Germany's Social Democrats agreed to embark on a formal coalition negotiation with Chancellor Angela Merkel's government following a weekend party vote. So basically, it's strengthening Merkel's chances of being re-elected a fourth time around. That's boosting the euro. Okay, now it's time to look at all the cues that we will have as we get started with a brand new trading week. Now, the last week was a completely historic one. Friday itself saw the market surging to fresh all-time highs. The Nifty breached 10,900 intraday, closed 77 points higher. That was the total tally. The Sensex gained 250 points, finally ended above the 35,500 mark for the first time ever. Banks were roaring. There was some resurgence in the mid-cap universe as well. And the buying continued from the foreign investor, investor standpoint. But for more on what might drive markets today. Let's say good morning to Nigel D'Souza. Morning, Nigel. Well, Shubhi, very good morning. Good to see you in so early, <laughs> first of all. Wonderful. Anything with, you know, with such great company, the two of you? Brilliant. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, talking about the markets, y'all have been talking about that shutdown and, you know, some of those Asian markets are trading in the red. The template is clear. You know, if you short the market, you don't make much money. Every shorting opportunity and every fall is followed up by bigger short coverage. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Now, in Friday's trading session, the Nifty hit the 10,000 900 mark the nifty bank came to the party and if you just see what happened in friday's trade the nifty bank outperformed the nifty and in fact for the entire of last week the nifty bank you know after all the shorting we saw all the underperformance uh, we saw well it was up close to around four and a half percent while the nifty was up only around two percent as it is we had the it index that has been doing well in 2018 that is up by close to around eight percent you have the nifty bank firing with the it index that's telling you more than 50 percent of uh, the Nifty's weights, they are doing well. And that's why, in fact, the Nifty has moved to all those highs. Who's selling? Institutions are not selling. Well, we ended virtually at the high point of the day in Friday's trading session. And net-net, the institutions, what? They pumped in close to around 1,200 crores approximately. And now, in fact, institutions, they're net buyers in 2018 itself. Both the FIs and the DIs, both of them are buyers. In fact, the FI flows is close to around a billion dollars. It's heading in that direction. So good flows coming in there. Intraday, we have one live indicator that we look out uh, in terms of the Nifty futures. Well, in fact, it moved to a premium that compared with the discount. Telling you that some of those shots, they were covering up. They were getting out of the market. And in fact, if you pull up the Nifty futures plate, you'll see that, in fact, the total open interest is on the heavier side. So some of those shots, they are just getting squeezed out and they're moving out. Well, the FIs, they added one short position for one long position, in fact, in Friday's trade. And um, the, they are net long, but they're very marginally. 52% of their positions are on the long side. What really happened in Friday's trade was the shots on the stock futures. They covered out, they got out of the market, and that was clearly visible in a stock like an India Bulls uh, housing finance. Well, in terms of options, they bought more amount of calls than puts. But the biggest
is positive that really I am looking at in terms of um, in terms of you know the derivatives uh, data is that they wrote closer on five puts for around two calls, telling you the base of the market is very very strong. And now that base has moved up, ten thousand four hundred. We talked about put ten thousand five hundred put. Now in Friday's trading session, in fact, they were writing the ten thousand eight hundred put as well as the ten thousand nine hundred call. Remember, this is expiry week. You know, ten thousand eight hundred put. Ten, yeah, ten thousand eight hundred put as well as the ten thousand nine hundred put. Both those two were very very active. And it's expiry week. We're up more than four hundred points in the series. The shorts are going to get squeezed out. A couple of stocks we're looking at: Reliance Industries, CLSA. They're quite positive on the stock. They've increased the target price. While uh, Wipro was a bit of a disappointment, finally from the ID pack. In fact, to their CLSA, they are saying that valuations at sixteen times look a little expensive. All right, Nigel, you alluded to a couple of stocks. The other stocks that you'll be watching out for? Well, a lot of results today. Asian Paints, uh, that's one big mm. number that we'll be looking at. Axis Bank as well, keep an eye out on that one. From the mid-cap space, there are quite a few stocks, the likes of Havel, Just Dial, I'll be keeping an eye out on all those stocks. Well, we were talking about pizza time in Friday's trading session, Jubilant Foodworks. What a dream run that stock has had from 800 to 2,100 from May 2017 to date. Well, CLSE, they've increased the target. There. They've even increased the EPS estimates. Now they're factoring in closure on 40 rupees per share, so keep an eye on that one. Groove Finance, the stock has had a big run. The loan growth looked good. It was better than expected on a sequential basis as well as a year in year basis. Talking about good numbers, Chennai Petro as well, those numbers look very, very good. We had uh, DCM Sriram as well, those numbers look good. In fact, the margins did expand. Good going over there. Godavari Power in his part, it was expected to be a good set of numbers. Well, we were working with a number of around 150, 170 crores in terms of operating profit. It came in good, and in fact, quarter four should be much better, so keep an eye out on that stock. JNA Axles as well. We were working with a good growth on the top line. That as well was a tad bit better, and the profit number as well did jump up. And in fact, Lux Industries, that's the other one we're looking at over there. The net profit number did jump up by close to around 30%. The other big one really we're looking at besides earnings and quarter three numbers, well, ONGC and HPCL. ONGC will pay around 475 rupees, 474 rupees for that 51% stake. That's a premium of around 13, 14% approximately. I remember last week at one point of time the street was talking about even a 40, 50% premium. ONGC opens up in the green for sure. HPCL, we'll have to keep an eye out on that one as well. Both those two stocks in focus. Okay, all right, Nigel. Thanks very much for that. Well, it's rather good. I mean, earnings when you go through whatever we've seen so far, it's been a, a pretty strong yeah. run. So let's see. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive now. India should continue with the reforms initiated by the Modi government, and it should increase the pace of reforms, if not want to accelerate the pace of growth to seven and a half percent. That's the word coming in from renowned economist Noriel Rubini in a conversation with Lata Venkatesh. Rubini also warned against fiscal slippage and pointed at the rise in India's long-term interest rates on the back of these fiscal slippage concerns. Uh, budgets are very big events in India because they are policy announcements by the government. Now, one of the normal debates is, should the government increase the fiscal deficit and invest so that it can give growth a leg up? Would that be your advice? Um, well, uh, my advice will be that, first of all, the budget deficit of India is still large at uh, the central level, but also your fiscal problem at the state and local level. And therefore, a fiscal prudence is necessary. And the risk is that even if you wanted to do a fiscal stimulus as a way of boosting economic activity, what you have observed in the last few months has been the long-term interest rates uh, in India have gone higher, and they've gone higher not just because of global factors, but more importantly because there was a concern that the fiscal deficits are too high. And even with the RBI marginally cutting uh, policy rates, the impact on long-term interest rate has been just to slow down the rise of these long-term interest rates. And therefore, any positive impact on economic growth coming from a meaningful fiscal stimulus is going to be undone by a potential rise in long-term interest rates that's going to crowd out uh, debt recovery. Of course, the country is facing fiscal challenges also because uh, when oil prices were falling, uh, debt reduction oil prices were not transferred to the retail level and it led to greater revenues for the government that were spent rather than saved in the good times. And now that oil prices are going higher, uh, either you increase uh, oil prices uh, to maintain the same revenues, but if you do that politically, a year before election, that's not something that's going to be appealing, and therefore the revenue is going to shrink, 
and the budget deficit is going to be rising, uh, that requires fiscal prudence because otherwise you're going to have increasing loan rates. Probably the way to square the cycle that you don't want to cut spending and revenues are falling and uh, you don't have a larger budget deficit will be more uh, divestments of uh, state-owned enterprises and selling the market and partially privatizing some of those assets. That will be good for the economy and it might be loosening up uh, the budget constraint that the government uh, is, is facing. So one advice to Prime Minister Modi? Uh, the advice will be that he has started the process of a variety of uh, economic reforms. Uh, more need to be done and the more those reforms occur, uh, the more chances are that potential growth of India goes from 7% to 7.5, from 7.5 towards 8%, but to get to 7.5, 8%, uh, current policies probably are not sufficient, but more needs to be done. And if he wants to pass uh, to history with the legacy of having changed for the better, India definitely should be continuing with the same policies uh, in the near future.